Hey guys and welcome to the channel. I'm Ken Smith and I wanted to start out by saying that I really truly apologize for not being able to speak live throughout this entire video. The reason why, quite honestly, was because there was so much construction noise that there was no way of filtering that out on the outside. On the inside of the building, it was just as bad uh, because the outside construction could be heard on the inside of the building plus there was an event that they were getting ready to set up. The building doesn't have air conditioning and there were multiple fans running all over the place. And so because of that noise, it just made complete sense to not include that into the video and just go ahead and kind of do a voiceover. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get inside and start talking about the uh, Ford's Paquette plant here in Detroit. There's a tremendous amount of history behind the Paquette plant. I'm just gonna cover a few highlights here. The Ford Motor Company's first purpose-built factory is the Paquette plant. Previously, space was rented on Mack Avenue. Here at the plant, Ford models B, C, F, K, N, R, S, and eventually the T were all assembled here the first Model T was developed here and introduced in 1908 as a 1909 model. The first 12,000 Model Ts were assembled here and shipped out by railroad. Eventually, Ford Motor Company relocated to its new Highland Park plant in 1910, selling the Paquette building to Studebaker in 1911, and Studebaker used it uh, for automotive production until 1933. The building obviously changed hands multiple times. Eventually, it was sold to the Model T Automobile Heritage Complex, i.e. the Ford Paquette Avenue Plant Museum, which is where we're at today. Now, Henry Ford's office is what we're looking at right now. His office was on the second floor of the Paquette plant. Uh, notice the safe off to the right of the office and made me wonder whether or not that's where he kept his millions maybe that's where he kept his plans maybe it's a combination of both who knows i don't know but i found that kind of fascinating that there was this massive safe that was sitting there if we back up a little bit what the museum did was actually cut a hole in a wall so that you could view it my guess would be it's also to probably stop uh, a tremendous amount of foot traffic from walking into the office Notice that as we look to those windows there, that's kind of what resembled the view back then. If we look outside the windows now, that's the view that we currently see. But I found it really fascinating as I looked at things closer that you could see copies of blueprints and maybe some advertisement. Um, there's a place for Henry to uh, for a lab coat maybe to hang up, a place to lie down, a um, place uh, to, for him to just gather his thoughts. Now, when we look down the hall, this is, uh, we're going to be heading towards the alphabet room. But again, th these floors, the second floor, the third floor, these were assembly areas where they assembled plants uh, or assembled cars. Um, the offices that you see here um, are currently being used by administration there, but these were also executive offices that were on both sides of this hallway that you see. The vehicle that we're currently looking at is a 1909 Model T Touring, and we'll just take a brief walk around that. So up on the wall, just before you start entering into the uh, assembly area, you can see the employee time clock and the time cards where they were stored. You can see a really good close-up of the in and out and just really, really fascinating how this time card clock punch worked. And 
uh, while they have it all blocked off now so that you can't mess with it or stick things in there and and whatnot, um, still found this really fascinating, very cool to see. This is an 1896 quadricycle that uh, was kind of Henry's very first vehicle. Now, this is obviously just a kind of a mock-up, and uh, but it gives you an idea of what uh, Henry's first automobile kind of looked like. Obviously, minus the not-so-period correct clamp, I thought that was actually kind of funny seeing that on there. But uh, nonetheless, this is Henry's uh, first vehicle. And as you walk around, there's other displays that you see. And I thought they were uh, quite fascinating. Up on the wall, you'll notice that um, during the time of the Paquette plant, you'll see all of the people who were uh, the leaders, essentially, of the Ford Motor Company. Notice the size of the pictures, though. I thought that was really kind of fascinating. Obviously, Henry's picture is the biggest. And as they move down the line of command, if you will, or the line of authority, or the line of responsibility, the pictures get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And uh, I thought that was really well done. Now, as we continue down the second floor of the Paquette plant, you'll see this display here, and this resembles what a Ford dealership would have looked like at the time of the Model T. And so notice the carpet and the advertising and the spacious area that customers could come in, walk around a car, feel that it's very elegant, and yet be a very ex inexpensive automobile for the time. So very well done display here. Really appreciate all that, um, the thoughtfulness that went into this to give you kind of an idea of what a typical dealership would have looked like during the day. Now this next room is called the Alphabet Room, and rightfully so, this is cars that are chronologically, for the most part, lined up from A to T. Now this particular model A is actually the very first model A, not to be confused with the model A that we all know and love today, but uh, I love the wicker on this vehicle. I thought it was really pretty unique, pretty cool. As we go down the aisle, uh, we get into other vehicles. Um, again, starting with the A all the way to the T, on the other side here. Now this room is used for all sorts of things and unfortunately all these chairs it was all being set up and it is what it is. I didn't particularly care for the facility being used this way but it is what it is. So the first vehicle that we just passed that was a 1904 Ford Model B followed by two red Ford Model C's. This vehicle here a Ford Model F and then next to it is another Ford Model F. Now, as we head down to the other side of the room, our next vehicle is a Model N runabout. And next to that is a Model R and a Model S runabout. And then the two vehicles here, they're both survivors. This is a Model S survivor and a Model SR survivor. And so what I mean by survivors is they haven't been restored. These are cars that have made it through time being untouched. Now this Model S here, this one has been restored. Now this big long, lean, sexy automobile is actually the Model K. And there's a lot of controversy behind this vehicle, but essentially some of the partners with Ford wanted to produce luxury automobiles. Ford didn't believe in producing luxury automobiles at a higher profit, but rather producing um, more affordable vehicles and with a lesser profit, but being able to sell more and uh, overall have larger profit at the end of the year. And so 
that's the controversial car, the Model K. Over here, we've got the 1909 Ford Model T Touring. This car would have been assembled in the very plant that we are in right now. And notice the advertising on the wall. And uh, just found that pretty fascinating. Now we're up on the third floor, but before we walk any further, I thought I'd show you this particular plaque. This, uh, this whole plant obviously deserves to be on the National Register of Historic Places, and it is. Now the other thing I wanted to point out is it's also used for a wedding venue, other parties, and whatnot. I'm not particularly thrilled about that. That's my two cents worth. I got to be honest with you. If I came here to see a museum, I want to see the museum. And I don't want to see a bunch of white chairs and tables and all that other stuff. If you want to have a venue here, uh, make a separate room and have that as a venue room. You don't need to um, set up a venue during the time that the museum is open. This is a 1910 Model T Tourabout. We're going to take a walk around this vehicle. Now this automobile is loaded with exquisite detail. Notice the woodwork and the finished color of the woodwork. It is absolutely gorgeous. This beautiful green colored paint scheme is complemented with a hand painted red pinstripe, which was very common for the time. The dashboard is also finished with the same beautiful color as the outside wood. It is worthy to note that things like floor mats were in use over 100 years ago. And the same holds true for leather seats. Worthy to mention is the rear seat design allowing passengers the opportunity to see views forward as well as on the sides. This is a true brass era automobile. All of it is in pristine condition. Notice how everything is brass right down to the pedal floorboard plates. Stunning gas lanterns as well as a magnificent looking horn adorn the outside of the vehicle. And when we examine the headlights, we see that Ford had no problem marketing his name. Even then, Henry Ford understood the importance of branding and we see it all over this vehicle. It truly is a magnificent automobile for its time. So we're up on the third floor and we're viewing a couple of rare automobiles in this room. First is a 1912 Flanders and then a 1912 Hupmobile next to it. This room has a mixture of several different brass era vehicles in it. Uh, next to that is the 1914 Regal Model T Touring. And next to that vehicle is a 1916 Detroit Electric. Now, even back then, there were electric vehicles, and uh, there's a nice explanation of the history of this particular automobile that was on display. The 1915 Dodge Brothers Touring is next to it, and I really loved the back window design uh, in the uh, top. I found that bit of detail really exquisite even back then. Um, it, while it's a brass era car, notice that there's not a lot of brass on this particular vehicle. And also worthy to note is the luggage rack that is fastened to the driver's side running board and not on the passenger side. Well, the reason why is that it was for safety reasons. As the automobile was becoming more and more popular in populated cities, car makers wanted passengers to enter from the curb side and not from the street side. Last but certainly not least is this exquisite 1916 Studebaker Model ED Turing automobile. Now this vehicle has lovely lines all around it. With that being said, we're going to head into the next room, which is also one of the assembly rooms, and take a look at what is on display for us there. As we enter this section, it is filled with several different commercial vehicles. As you can see, some vehicles have solid wood bodies of different designs, while others have a combination of wood and steel, yet each one still contains a tremendous amount of wood in them. Now I found this particular vehicle very interesting. This 1923 Ford French Depot hack 
has what appears to be a morphed covered wagon back into it. Now, my limited understanding to what a depot hack was during that time frame was a vehicle that was built for the purpose of picking up or dropping off passengers that were arriving or departing by train. Notice the bench style seating that run on each side instead of rows of seats. I am thinking this would allow more passengers inside the vehicle. Now I'm not sure where the luggage would have gone, but again, the vehicle is very different than a typical automobile. Now as I walk around the vehicle, I circle back to this delivery truck. Notice the hand painted stencil work. Nowadays vehicles are wrapped, but back then these were hand painted by exceptionally talented artists. The detail is nothing short of spectacular. In my opinion, this is truly a lost art today. This is a 1925 model TT dump truck. The model TT was a one ton truck that derived from a model T car chassis. It utilizes a stronger frame, heavier rear axle, and the addition of two rear springs. After getting up close to these tires, I'm thinking it's time for some new tread. Now this is not your ordinary fire truck. This is actually a 1921 Ford Model T chemical fire truck. Designed to combat chemical fires, this was used by the East Detroit Fire Department. This beautifully restored service vehicle is magnificent from the woodwork to the final pinstriping and hand painted lettering. Note the hand crank siren on the passenger side. Now this is a 1925 Ford Model T snow machine and is one of the very first all-terrain vehicles for snow. It increased the number of passengers for snow travel, assisted mail carriers, doctors and utility companies in hard to reach remote areas during the winter months. This basic design eventually launched the modern snowmobile industry. It was highly utilized by the post office and first responders. This snowmobile conversion kit was made from 1923 to 1928 in New Hampshire by a local Ford dealer named Virgil White. The kit included a TT truck worm gear differential, two front skis, heavy duty wheels to replace the original wheels, two extra rear wheels with axle, two double elliptical springs to suspend that extra axle, fully assembled tracks, and two 26 and a half inch rear frame extension channels. The kit cost $400 and when added to a Ford Model T costing roughly the same amount, it resulted in an unbeatable winter snow machine. This is a fine example of how a Model T is actually built. There is over 100 footboard of lumber in the average Model T. Essentially, a sheet metal body is placed over a wooden skeleton like the one you see and then nailed and screwed into its final position. While the first 12,000 were built right here, can you imagine how fast these vehicles were being pumped out at the Highland Park assembly plant? The woodworking craftsmanship is truly remarkable considering the tools available during that time period. It's hard for me to fathom how the recycled crate for floorboards still continues to spread around, yet when I see something like this, I can't imagine why anyone would continue to believe in that story. I guess old myths somehow never die. Now, if you have not seen my video on that very subject, I will go ahead and put a link down in the description below. Still on the third floor, we are now entering the second to the last assembly room for the Paquette plant. And as I walk down the room, notice the three speedsters on my left. Now these were all stock Model T cars that were eventually converted by their owners into racers. The first one is a cannibalized 1920 Ford Model T. This vehicle is pretty much stripped of anything that was not necessary or had any significant amount of weight to it. In the middle, this is a 1926 Model T faultless speedster. Now in the 20s, over 50% of the cars in America were Model Ts. 
this huge surplus of cars presented an opportunity for those who saw them as a blank canvas upon which to create a bit of flair and individualism in an otherwise any color as long as it's black world. It was a very lucrative aftermarket trade that soon sprang up to supply self-starters, horns, motor meters, speedometers, auxiliary transmissions, water pumps, and even aftermarket bodies. The racy example on display here is a body made by the American Top and Body Company that was located in Indiana. The style would be described as a boat-tailed speedster. Now, as I turn to the other side, this display shows how the different assembly stages actually took place. Again, the Model T was first assembled in different stages, and each stage or assembly room helped to produce the final vehicle that you see in the video. Now, you may be asking questions like, how did they get the vehicle down to the main floor when it was assembled? Or how did they get materials up to assemble the vehicle? Well, there were service or freight elevators that transported raw material up to the different floors, as well as a fully assembled car down to the main floor, ready to be shipped out by rail. The overhead signage that you see helps to explain the different stages of assembly, and each sign is carefully placed above the examples of the different stages that you see. As we head to the very back of the floor, we see what is now called the secret room. Set up by foundry boss Charlie Sorensen, the room was established for what Henry Ford described as a completely new job. At this point, Ford's Model N together with its sportier R&S variants was the top selling car in America and the experimental room team embarked on the job with the anticipation that they would be crafting an evolution of the Model N, but instead it would become the birthplace for the Model T. Based on physical evidence in the building and interviews with workers employed at this very facility, a team of experts and volunteers brought the experimental room back to life. This included furnishing it with the equipment the T-Team used in 1907 and 1908, which included a drafting table, a chalkboard, a camera to record design ideas, workbenches, toolboxes, workers' lunch pails, and a 250 volt DC motor turning an overhead line shaft that powered belt driven machine tools such as a lathe, a drill press, and a milling machine. And as a side note, the entire plant was powered by DC voltage and not AC current that we all use today. The source of that DC current was from its own power station built right next to the plant. The space is illuminated by a reproduction of the original GE arc lamps and also an old rocking chair duplicates the rocker Henry Ford occupied while directing operations. And a Model N chassis represents the starting point of the T project. I truly felt like I traveled back in time as I viewed in awe at the detail that was in this display. It was the perfect grand finale of my visit here. Now, if you are still curious as to why I did a voiceover with this entire video, just listen to this next clip and you will completely understand why I went through all that trouble. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Uh, remember to give us a like and a subscribe. Most of all, be blessed. And now I'm gonna jump inside the museum store and try to find me one of those.